It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Woohoo! Oh, I forgot to open the chat room. And today, my very special guest is Miss Robin Frederick, a dear friend, an amazing song coach, and the author of this best selling book. And she will be at the Taxi Road Rally on Saturday, November 5th from 11.30 to 12.30? I don't remember the uh, time. Oh, I think it's 11, I think. Uh-oh, I better check. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think while it's you're a, checking. 10.45 or, yeah, 10 or 11. The, I'm going to open I better the, check. the chat or get the chat window open. Uh, all right, there it is. Pop out chat. All right. Got oh, can I see that on. too? Is it? Uh, the road rally is going to be awesome. It got very real for me this past weekend. Uh, myself, Ariana, and Angel were proofing the little booklet, which I don't have in front of me. You know, the taxi booklet that got with all the schedule and everything and the grids of who's going to be where and who's teaching what class and the bios and everything. All that stuff got finalized this morning at 10 o'clock and went to the printer. Um, speaking of the printer, printing costs have doubled since 2019. Instead of spending $3,400 on this book, I'm spending $6,200 to print the book. Mm -hmm. um, but the road rally, I mean, once we do that, we know it's really happening. There's no stopping it. And you guys uh, who are watching the show today, you can see all the stuff. If you go to taxi.com slash rally or road rally, all that stuff is up on the website finally. So there's that, and Robin and I are going, well, actually, Robin more than me, is going to do, um, give song feedback today. And uh, say a quick hello to everybody in the chat room. Hello, guys. Um, just making sure that our audio levels are good for you. We spent a little time tweaking those before the show, but clearly I don't see anybody um, complaining, so that's good. Wow, Ted Fox is in the chat room today. Ted, are Ted. you coming to the road rally? Ted's like one of my oldest taxi friends. I love that guy. Um, all right, sounds fine. Yay, Ann House is in the house. She's always in the house. Um, okay, so let's get right to it. Um, and you ready, Robin? You feeling okay? I'm ready. Here I am so go. ready. Yeah, as long as they can see me and hear me, I am ready. Yeah. I am too. Um, so the first one we're gonna hear, actually, I'm gonna pull this over here so I don't have to look away every time. Okay, first thing up is Between the Raindrops by Randall Mark. Let me know when you've heard enough to start your comments and I'll fade it and we'll be good to go. Tears falling down Trapped in between all the raindrops Good. Beautiful, beautiful vocal. Absolutely love that vocal. Female vocal on this is just perfect. The fragility and the emotion in it, absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful track. Um, it's definitely, I'm looking over here at the lyrics. I actually have all the lyrics here, so I've been through them. And um, it's definitely universal. Uh, it, the use of imagery is really nice. The, um, let's see, uh, all of the world is a beautiful pearl. Look around it. Absolutely beautiful. And a word like pearl just evokes a lot of um, feelings of warmth and beauty and, you know, soft sheen. It's a really nice choice there. A beautiful pearl. Look around it. Um, 
the what I noticed that what happens is that you've got a um, a lot of different emotions that you're going for. So for example, the the chorus expresses hope. It looks to me like that's what you're mainly talking about. Hope rides on the wings of the eagle. That happens right as you go into that major section. Hope rides on the wings of the eagle. And then it mentions love and peace. Uh, but in the verses, it's talking about tears and fear. So we're going between the emotions pretty quickly. and um, And then there's that big change up into the chorus where you go from a minor soft feel in the verse and you go into this big major feel with this huge uh, vocal leap which she's able to make um and so i think that there could be a problem with this because they can't both sections and when you jump into another emotion and it, the focus of it is really not as tight as you would want for a scene it's we're talking about a lot of different things. So what I would recommend is working backwards from that beautiful opening line of your chorus, hope rides on the wings of the eagle and stick with hope in at least that one section. Hope rides on the wings of an eagle. Hope can do wonderful things. All the world is a beautiful pearl when you look through the eyes of hope. Right. So then the song becomes about hope. Then the music supervisor knows what kind of scene to use it in. So even though you have a universal lyric here about emotion, it's because it's spread. It's not really focused. The music supervisor won't know what kind of scene to put this in. And it's going to be kind of all over the landscape. So I recommend taking um, a strong line. This, you know, everybody just take a str either your opening line of your first verse or your payoff line of your chorus or the opening line of your chorus and work backwards from that. Once you have it, start looking at are all my other lines leaning you know, in towards that same uh, message so that you could put, know what kind of scene you could put it under. And I think a scene, a, a song about hope or love or peace, any of those things that you've got uh, in the song would all work very well. Just stay focused on one of them. That would be my feedback. Beautiful song, absolutely beautiful. It is gorgeous. I only had one thought. Uh, not, I mean, this show's really about your feedback, but something that music supervisors will talk about a great deal with instrumental music is you got to tell me what the piece is going to do right up front. I need to know what this piece mm. is about. Don't give me a long drawn out um, intro. So this, because of the tempo of it and the very lilty legato lyric, you're right, lyrics right up front need to give you something that if a music supervisor is auditioning, and we're not only talking about the context of film and TV here, but in the context of film and TV, the music supervisor needs to get, needs to know what this is about quickly enough that they will either say, yes, this is going to work, or this is probably going to work, so I'm going to stick with it and see which part of the song I can bring up in that scene. Uh, so that's really not feedback on the song so much as just pointing something out that when you've got a song that's slow to develop, it's got to be really good so the supervisors can sink their teeth in right away. Yep, yep, that's true. Draw them in with your, make your intro your welcome mat and draw the listener or the music supervisor, that's the same thing, uh, into your song. This is going to come up more often today. Cool. All right, uh, next one, and I'm going to bring the level down a little bit and give me a thumbs up when it's good for you, Robin, because we know this one, we <laughs> tested it before, it's quite loud. This one's called Bring It On by Marcy Martell. Rock and roll. Show me your shrewd sorted best. Give me a taste of your sweetness. Guide me to the modern river's edge. The dirty Good, good, right. great. 
Okay. Uh, this is a great genre to be doing for film and television. There isn't enough female rock, I think. Now, the uses for female rock, there's a there are fewer uses for female rock than for male rock, but um, there isn't as much competition for you. So, uh, Marcy, this is a good area for you to be in. Now, um, this is universal. It's got great imagery. I love the uh, guide me to the muddy river's edge, the dirty waters ahead. Lots of imagery in the verse, your sordid best. Give me a taste of your sweetness. Really vivid language that really gets this across. Um, uh, and I think it's very well written. Uh, one thing I would say about the chorus, the bring it on, bring it on. I would vary the third, bring it on, say something different and then come back to bring it on. Just give that third line a little something different to keep the listener interested. Four uh, X repeat is a little bit much for listeners, but go away for the third line, then come back to bring it on for your fourth line. Uh, just in general, folks, that's a good idea anytime you're doing a 4X repeat like that. Now, here's what I'm going to suggest. This is a very well-written song. It's really tight all the way through. The message is there, but it's kind of an un unusual message. You're not going to find very many. Um, it's not a common scene. It's not a common situation. Um, show me your worst, you know, do your worst and I'll like it. I mean, that's basically what this is saying. And I think it's really unique and it works for rock. But if you're going to be pitching this for film and television, I think this is going to be too unusual of a situation to find very many uses. If you are interested, maybe for your next song, or if you're interested in doing it on this song, and this is for everyone as well, if you're interested in doing rock, then think about doing songs for uh, sports, competitions, video games, um, reality TV shows that are uh, con contests, um, those work really well for those uses. And there are people getting a lot of placements in, and there isn't um, a ton of competition there. So if you want to think about doing a, something like that, if you wanted to do it with this song, I had a little suggestion. I noticed that on your second pre-chorus, we didn't play that part of it, but on your second pre-chorus, you say, I'm ready, time to roll, feel it in my soul, primed for the fight, make me feel alive. Those four lines work great for a sports, a song, a competition show, a contest. I'm ready, bring it on. I'm going to face my competition. I'm going to win. I've got it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. This works great for that. So if you ever, if you feel like rewriting this one, I would say that you'd have a lot more pl uh, places that you could pitch it. To hear more songs like this, listen to an artist like Zayd Wolf, Z-A-Y-D-E, Zayd Wolf, W-O-L-F. He does it for a living and he gets a lot of placements. It's not, you're not going to sit down and listen to his albums from beginning to end because they're all the same theme. But look at how he varies that all the way through 10, 12 songs, and they'll all be perfect for video games. And they're all, you know, they have names like Hero and um, I can't remember all the, the titles alone are hysterical once you know what he's doing. He's very good at it. So I think you could do it. And I think you could have a lot of fun with rock and roll and pitching it to film and television with those kinds of lyrics. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Did somebody say they couldn't? I can. Uh, people were saying you were much louder than I am. Ooh, um, this whole so, thing is weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you anyway. said the levels were low when we did the sound uh, check. Yeah. If you want to raise yours, I can lower my end because um, you sound how, fine to me. Uh, John Pearson saying I'm a little low. All right. I brought myself up. Okay. <laughs> Ken Messert says down. I'm only low when I'm talking. It's so weird. I've got, I don't know. Very <laughs> I'm only low right. and I'm talking. Well, okay. I'm just going to move the microphone close, closer. Maybe, hey, the old analog way. Move your mic closer. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, moving on. Okay. Good. Excellent. So far, excellent. Uh, really good songs here. I, I've already been looked at these, so I know they're all good. Okay, uh, now we're going on to one called Borrowed Time by Lee Rosenthal, also known as The Soulmates. S-O-L-E, Soulmates. Soulmates, that's right, uh, if the oh, shoe okay. fits. Oh, come on. Yeah. 
It's a it's a very it's a witty fresh take on the idea of aging. If you live too long, no one's left. I mean, it's it's really honest. It's really true, and people don't think about it. Um, so I really got a kick out of this song. I really enjoyed listening to it, Lee. And um, I thought that the style, which is very Americana folk, was the right style for this kind of back porch theme. It's it's sort of like Will Rogers standing around, sort of you know being all <laughs> philosophical with you. I like that a lot. Um, I don't, as far as the universal lyric. Um, here's the thing: this type of lyric, um, this is uh, something the script would probably show, and a character might say. A character would say something like, um, uh, "Let's see, I, I feel like a, I feel like an old broke down car." That's what a guy would say in that kind of scene. So we can't say that for him. Um, we don't want to be stepping on the script writer. We don't want to do the script writer's job. They've got to do it themselves. It's not for us to do anyway. So when we're doing universal lyrics, our goal is to write the song that the characters really kind of can't say. You know, because it's humans don't come right out and say, "I'm feeling really resigned," or "I'm tired." I mean, that's the emotion that would be underneath what you're writing. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm resigned. I feel like I'm losing touch with life, and and I think that you could get a lyric out of that、um, by using some of this as a refrain. So I'm not sure what the what the structure of this was. I wasn't real careful. I, excuse me. I wasn't real aware as I was listening of what your structure was. So, <laughs> excuse me. To me, I'm looking for a couple of refrain lines that you can repeat. And I think the refrain lines here might be everything ends, all things must change, and if you live too long, no one remains. The first, the opening two lines of the song. Uh, might be the best ones to use as a repeated refrain throughout the song because they kind of sum up that sense of resignation, and and yeah, you know it's it's quirky, it's lost. He's being kind of stiff upper lip about it, but it's it's really kind of sad, and he knows it. So I think we have to say that, and and then the rest of the song, if if you are interested in writing. For it to be a universal lyric, or your next song, if you want to do a universal lyric, I would stick with the emotion. Sitting out, you know,、um, you know, watching the sun go down as a metaphor for, you know, watching what happens in your life. Sitting here watching the sun go down every night, night after night, sun goes down, you know, and it and it feels like too many sunsets in my life. Something like that that gives us how he feels that probably the scriptwriter wouldn't say. That's the difference. Yeah, the the best. The best tip you've ever given me in all the years we've known each other is when the lyric is telling too much story. It's,、mm. You've got to rely on what is the base emotion. What is this story going to make you feel like? And that's absolutely true、uh, because that's what supervisors are looking for. They're、mm -hmm. looking to reinforce that emotion to make the people watching it. Feel it more deeply. They're not looking to have the story told in a different way, or retold, or stepping on the the script. They're just looking for support for that emotion. So, pay attention, folks. This lady's really,、yeah. really wise. Ah,、oh, thank you, thank you. And you know, a music supervisor is looking for a song to enhance and beef up the emotion in the scene. And so we have to be looking. That's why we're always writing about emotion. And and comparing that emotion to think using metaphors and comparisons to to get that emotion across. All right, I am moving on to one、okay. called. I like this title, Nightmare Fuel. <laughs> I like the name of the group, the artist, True Swans. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. 
I've seen true swans in taxi success stories, I'm pretty sure. Oh, good. All right, this is Michelle Lindley, also known as True Swans. Song is called Nightmare Fuel. Let's have a listen. Let's bring it later. I th yeah, I think that this is the co the refrain, nightmare come to life, shine a light in the dark, nightmare fuel, lighting a match, catch fire, watch them burn. I think that's the refrain. Um, and it gets repeated after the next four lines and uh, gets repeated twice after the next four lines. So it's definitely the refrain. Um, it's not, uh, I refer to some kind of these shorter choruses that we do use in film and TV, um, two lines, four lines. I'll sometimes refer to them as a refrain or an undeveloped chorus. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing for film and TV because they do like those simple, direct, not too complicated choruses to put um, at the end of a scene and kind of button that scene. They really like that. So um, that's why I refer to that as a refrain. It's a four line chorus. Um, okay, I love, by the way, love this uh, baritone voice. You don't hear enough baritone voices. Um, I always tell people, look for those areas, those niches where there isn't a ton of competition. And if you can do that, and obviously the singer is a really good baritone, um, then uh, fill that space. Uh, if you want to hear other baritone voices, you can check out The National. Uh, the National is used a lot in film and television, and also Greg Laswell. L-A-S-W-E-L-L, -L, Greg Laswell, also used a lot in Blacklist, one of our favorite shows for, for songs. They had just such good taste in songs. Um, and Greg Laswell got used a lot. So uh, those two are both baritones. And um, so when you're working with a baritone like this, I think this is the right song for it. It's got that dark, moody feel. You'll hear that in the National. You'll also hear it in Greg Laswell. Um, let's see. Uh, feel the darkness creeping in thought the nightmare was over that's the opening line so we know what's being set up here this is the type of song that would be used underneath a dark paranoia this it expresses paranoia anxiety fear so with halloween coming up this would be the kind of these would be the kinds of shows where a song like this might be used um feel the darkness creeping in thought the nightmare was over monsters hiding under the bed things aren't what they seem very good opening really strong opening four lines then it seems to go a little bit off the track when it goes run run hide and seek i will find you you can't hide i think that's where the female voice came in and i i'm not sure whether this is supposed to be another voice other than the singer so it i think i would just stick with the singer it gets a little complicated as soon as we try to bring in another voice um, because that may not be what's going on in the scene. So you want to keep consistent and have the singer's point of view be very consistent and have a certain amount of flow through that song so that it could it works underneath the scene because the scene's not changing. Um, we don't know if there's some other voice coming in. It's a little too specific for film and TV. Um, nightmares, then your four line refrain, nightmares come to life, shine a light in the dark. I'm not sure why nightmares would shine a light in the dark or is it, or is it referring to someone else? Quick, shine a light in the dark. I, unclear. So as a listener, I can't quite track along with that with that lyric. Nightmares fuel, nightmare fuel, lighting a match. I can't follow that. Catch fire, watch them burn. Them, 
who. So as a listener and a music supervisor is just a listener, they're looking for to use a song for a use, but they're still just a listener. So as we were talking about earlier, you want to be sure you capture that music supervisor just like a listener and get them involved in the song, caught up in it, engaged in it. And that means that it has to track for the listener. So see if you can go back. This song is definitely worth working on. See if you can go back and, and really emphasize those feelings of paranoia, anxiety, um, and uh, fear in, for the listener and stick with the listener's point of view. Stay with that. Um, and however you want to do that, then clarify your four-line refrain so that they could use that at the end of a scene, let's say, nightmares come to life, Nightmare, nightmares come to life. Um, nightmares never shine a light. You know, they just don't. She's um, actually in the chat room, and Michelle commented that um, it was written for a particular scene. So in that case, that changes the whole thing. Well, if you, but yeah, if you're you scoring a scene, but yeah. yeah, but you'd have to be scoring the scene in order right. to do that. So if she's writing because the scene, if you're writing to a music brief, and it's saying, okay, initially the singer is here, and then this night this monster shows up. Then yeah, yeah. But yeah, if I don't, I would say if you want to pitch a song more than once, that using something that's it is not particular to the scene is probably a better idea. So so, uh, record two versions of this: the one that you pitch to that music brief, and the one that you're going to pitch to other music supervisors. By the way, you just brought up a great point, which is. When libraries are looking to sign stuff, one of their criteria oftentimes, not 100% of the time, but oftentimes is how pitchable is this for more than yes. one thing? They're looking for a universality uh, that, oh, it could be used for this, could be used for that, could be used for something else. So it, it may be a B plus song that's very pitchable to a lot of scenarios. Uh, you could have an A plus song that only works in one type of scene, which means it's going to get, you know, sync maybe once every five or 10 years versus something where the song isn't quite as strong, but is very applicable to a lot of different things, might get synced four times a year. So that goes into their equation when they're signing material. Right, when they're signing a song to a music library. And I just want to clarify something. It means that the song will work in a range of scenes within that emotional tone. Right. You're not trying to write a song that's going to fit with a whole lot of scenes that aren't related to each other. But any scene that has, like, let's, like this song, any scene that has a dark, fearful, anxious, uh, uh, paranoid feel to it, this song should be able to work no matter what's going on on the scene. Otherwise, what you're actually doing is scoring a scene. And there's a difference between writing song between scoring a scene and writing to that specific scene versus writing a song that a music library, as you as Michael just said, a music library can pitch, it can get a lot of pitches out of because there are a lot of scenes like that. This type of scene, yep, there's a lot of scenes like that. So let try that. Try an alternate version of that. As I was reaching out to people to be guests or panelists at the Road Rally, I spoke to an old friend of mine who's a music supervisor working on uh, trailers. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't join us, but she and I got into a conversation for like half an hour. And uh, I said to her, what is the deal? So many people, this has been going on for years, like five, six, seven years already, using slow, dark, mysterious, yeah. ethereal stuff for trailers. Versus Most of us, when we think of trailers, we think of bam, taiko drums, big orchestral hits all that kind of stuff. But there are plenty of trailers out there that are dark and slow and kind of smoldering. And I said to her, you know, for as much attention as I pay to this stuff and, and listen to the choices in the trailers, it's like, how do you even write a brief for that? Because oftentimes it has nothing to do with the storyline of the film, but it does pluck one emotion and makes that emotion mm -hmm. central. Yeah. And they find right. the one line doing. in the dark song that has something that relates to that emotion. They use it. But I said, how do you write a brief for that? How do you find this stuff? And she goes, honestly, Michael, it's mostly dumb luck and just listening to thousands of things. And then all Lots. of a sudden you go, that's the one. Yeah. 
I'm going to show a commercial at the road rally. I'm going to show a commercial. And the song appears to fit perfectly, but the song was written first and they are editing it so it fits. It's wow. really interesting what they use. They use the pre-chorus, two, the two bars of the intro, the pre-chorus, and three lines of the chorus in this commercial. It's a big so commercial too. It's a national commercial. They cut the commercial. video to the song. No, they cut oh. the song to the video. Oh, okay. Yeah. They yeah cut I was going to say, off. if they cut the commercial to the song, that must have been mm -hmm. like a Beatles hit or something. Yeah, no. They, right. They would never do that. No, they cut the song to fit. But they knew what lines they were going to use. And when you look at this, when you look at the commercial, you realize how much thought goes into choosing a song for a national television commercial and how they decide how to build that to that peak moment and then come down. And, of course, the peak moment is usually the top of your chorus. And that's exactly what they used. Um, it's really interesting. So I'll play that at the Road Rally. Awesome. Um, why don't you tell everybody what you're going to do at the Road Rally? I know that the Ooh. second half of what you're going to do is we're going to do some of this. We're going to actually listen to songs from the audience. And it's we didn't run a listing like we did for some of the other listening panels. What we're going to do, and this is going to be quite fun, we did it years ago, which is I pick somebody from the audience randomly on the left side of the room, somebody on the right side of the room, and say, okay, you two, go run up the aisles. Anybody that's got a song that they'd like to have a shot of Robin doing some feedback on, drop it in this mail bin, and they're going to go out and collect this stuff, and then we're going to bring it up, and Robin will just reach in randomly, pick something, play it, and do this. So um, it's... It's a good fake, a, a good test of Robin's skill set. Yeah, it's pretty some... scary, actually. I, you know, <laughs> oh, come I've on. looked at these ahead of time, so yeah, uh, it's tough to do on the fly because I really think about this stuff. But before we do, I do that. I'm yeah. for the first half of it. I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna play you a couple of hit songs and then this uh, commercial with a song, uh, hit commercial, a successful song, film and TV, a couple of them, and I'm gonna show you exactly what I do how you learn stuff from successful songs that you might want to use in your own songs. And of course you can study successful film and TV songs and learn from them. So that's exactly what I do in my books. I just, I'm saying, I all the time I'm saying, Oh, look at this idea here where, that you could do with rhythmical repetition in your melody. Ooh. And here's a song that does it. And here's a song that does it. And here's a song that does it. And, and that's what I'm going to show you how I do that. So you can go do it because really it's all about your ears. Everything is just listening. All I'm doing is listening to these songs and going, does this work? Does this flow? Does this track? Where does this move me? And that's what music supervisors are doing too. They're just listeners on steroids. They've listened to a lot and they, they, they have radar in their ears. I mean, they know as soon as they start hearing a voice, as soon as they start hearing uh, where that thing is going, they know whether they're going to be able to use it or not. And, um, it's not that they don't want to listen to more of the song. If you've got a song that moves them, they will listen to the whole song. But for the most part, they're looking for something they can use and they'll know very quickly whether they can use something or not. The average, uh, if I had to pick a number, uh, the average number of songs on a typical phone for a music supervisor. Years ago, John Houlihan told me he easily had 10,000 on his phone. So I asked that question a lot, and I would say it's more like 20,000, maybe even higher. That's how many pieces of music are on the phones of music supervisors. And they're, even though they may not be entirely encyclopedic about like knowing every lyric line of every song, you could play them the first four or five notes of a song and they can spit out to you what it's about. They, they at least know it topically because that's their special, that's their superpower is being able to mentally reference. Oh yeah. I remember I heard a thong, song three and a half years ago that would work for this scene. And they may not remember every lyric about it, but they remember that it's got something that would work in the scene. Somebody asked the question in the chat, do you want us to, for the music that could potentially get listened to on Robin's panel, do you want us to bring it on, on um, USB drives or CDs? And the answer no. is CDs, even though they're old school, um, if I were Robin, and I'm sure I speak for her on this, I would not mm -hmm. want to be plugging a bunch of random USB drives into my computer because 
God only knows what kind of electronic STDs they could bring with them. I went looking to see if I could get a standalone uh, flash drive player, and there's no such thing, as far as I can tell. There's no Walkman for flash drives. Right. So you would have to, it would have to go into the computer. So, yeah, the, that's exactly right. But I can, I do have an adapter now for iPhone. I can put my headphones into your iPhone. I can put them into your Android phone. I can listen on phone if you've got your song on a phone. Yeah, but the problem is we need to bring the phone. Oh, I'm the sorry. audio system for the ballroom. Yes. So I'll be it, doing two hours of feedback from 1.30 to 3.30 at my booth. And if right. you bring me your phone at that point, yes, you're right. We, I can't do that in the, in the ballroom. You could, but nobody would hear it. That's right. <laughs> that I'd just be talking to the air. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could hear this song, folks. It's really good. Now, here's some feedback. <laughs> All right. Speaking of songs, this one's called This Song Ain't For Us, and it's by Cassie Lufen. I'm going to say L-E-U-F-F-E-N. Cassie, I hope I didn't butcher your name. Here we go. All packed up. Here's the very last box, baby, seeing you go ain't easy But we've been up and down and spinning all around This rodeo is making me queasy And the very last thing you said to me As I gave a quick pat on the dash Was I should write about us in a song about love That was true, but it still didn't last Well, this song ain't for you And this song ain't for me the song is for the boys and the girls who still have the whole world ahead of them Like how we used to be It's for the candy, can't sleep, crazy love It's for the feel my heart be kind of rush It's for the happily ever after It's you and me forever Hearts in the sand, kind of mushy stuff Yeah, it's for the first kiss, first dance, first I do It's for the reckless romance, nothing to lose It's for the young and the dumb And all the innocent ones who still don't know this song ain't for us. That's great. That's great. I love it. Five years in and you made a okay. new man. Well done, Cassie. A very, very clever lyric um, about, you know, this, you know, all country songs are you and me. It's about you and me or we're breaking up or whatever. But uh, I'll write a love song about this song ain't for us. Um, it's really good. And I love some of these lines all the way through, um, uh, especially in the chorus. It's for the young and the dumb and all the innocent ones. Uh, really good, Cassie. Great writing. And it's a strong, it's a good, strong uh, a melody as well. Now, this is aimed at contemporary country. And there's an issue, there are a couple issues with that that you may already be familiar with if you've been working in the film and television area. And that is for universal lyrics, country lyrics as a rule, because that's the, you're running a mental movie for the listener. That's what makes country lyrics so strong and so delightfully appealing is that you can picture this whole, the whole thing right from the first line, all packed up. Here's the very last box. That's the opening line of verse one. So we can't do that because if it's, if there's, that's not going on in the scene, right. then people are going, well, what, what last box? Wait a minute. It's telling the story. It's telling the script story. And if it is what's going on, and this is what we should talk about that we haven't yet, Michael, is what is what what if it is going on in the scene, if you're writing, if the song is playing and it's saying all packed up, here's the very last box, and the scene is about two people moving, um, then it's too on the nose. And on the nose is a term of art that is used in film and television uh, uh, song supervision, um, meaning that it's telling the story, the same script, that's the same story the script is telling. And when you do that, what happens is, um, I've asked a couple of really uh, major uh, film music supervisors, Stephen R. Goldman, I asked him this one time, and he said, well, as far as we can tell, we don't know why this happens, but as far as we can tell, um, when a song starts telling the story of the scene, uh, viewers drop out of the scene. They stop their emotional connection, their engagement, mm -hmm. their willingness to believe that the characters are real and this is really happening and the viewer is feeling what's happening. As soon as the song comes out and it's telling the story of the scene, uh, viewers step back. 
and they become aware that they're watching a scene. And all of that connectedness, all of that emotion just evaporates. And of course, no director wants that to happen. So um, we don't know why that, that happens, but we do know that it does happen. And that's why we can't do songs that tell, the, tell a story because either it is going on in the scene, which is a bad thing, or it isn't going on in the scene, which is also a bad thing. So it just won't work. Uh, for film and television so as delightful as country lyrics are they work really well for radio they don't work well for film and tv in radio you're running a mental movie in the listener's head because they haven't got any visuals they haven't got anything except the song to keep them entertained and the emotion that's in the song and so you've got a, everything you do gets them engaged visually mentally you know physically in, engaged in your song um, but we don't have to tell stories because the, the in film and TV because of course the visual will tell that that story. I want to go back for a minute to the um, CD versus USB drives for the rally just to clarify. Right after we talked about that, I saw Mark Field posted something in the chat that said, "But Michael said bring USB drives." USB drives to give out to people because most people don't have CD players anymore. But in the case in the ballroom, I don't want Robin sticking a USB drive into her computer and, and getting a virus. So we're going for CDs on that one. Um, and in the one-to-one -one mentoring rooms, bring your phone. Um, we are going to have AKG headphones in there that the um, mentor can jack into your phone and listen like that. So Great. bring everything you've got on your phone. Keep it well organized and, and put a, a widget on, on your phone's front page or your desktop, whatever they call it, so you can find that uh, very easily. Nothing worse than when you sit down to do a one-to-one -one and somebody's going, ah, oh, crumb, I just I, I put it on here last week before I flew out, and they spend half of their time looking for the song. So yeah. make it easy. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Now we're moving on. I have a thing for alliterative names. I do. I don't know why, but when all of my daughters got named, I went for, um, there's a little singy song to them. Anyway, I like this one, uh, Susie Schwartz. It just <laughs> rolls off the tongue easily. So Susie, we're going to listen to your song somewhere in the in-between. Beautiful. Beautiful, Susie. Uh, this is really lovely. I wanted to get as far as that last section, that section there where you had the string quartet come in. It was such a nice choice uh, to get there. Um, that's your refrain section, uh, somewhere in the in-between, somewhere in the in-between. Um, bringing that uh, quartet, string quartet in there um, was a really nice idea. Uh, this is definitely a universal lyric. It could work in a lot of scenes, scenes having to do with um, the mood of dis um, emotions of despair, loss, loneliness, disconnectedness, a disrupted life, something that um, this person is not connecting with others. 
and uh, just as you say, somewhere in the in between. One thing I would, a couple of things I would suggest, because I think this is definitely worth working on. And if you've got that track separate from your vocal, and the vocal, by the way, is beautiful. I and if you can record, if you're recording this at home, I would put a, I would make some changes in this, and definitely this song is worth working on and pitching. Um, somewhere in the in between, again, we have that kind of lots of repeats. We have a three full line repeat somewhere in the in-between and then somewhere, somewhere. And I think it's a little bit too much. I would really take a look at that third line. Uh, and instead of repeating somewhere in the in-between, I would find a way to say, to evoke what it is that you mean by the in-between, that place where nothing is connected, that place where no one else is, that place where only I am, the place where the air stops moving. The, but you I mean you could be as poetic as you want, but you want to give the listener that sense of um, it's really depression is what you're writing about, and um, that sense of the air stops moving, nothing is changing. You're caught. You're stuck in the in between, and so I want that in that third line, so that when you open with those lines, which is a very good choice by the way, opening with those lines by the third line, you say this is what I. This is what it feels like to be in the in-between. We don't have to go any further than that. Just like Michael was saying earlier, the music supervisor will know by the time they finish those four lines, I'm interested in this song. But I need a little bit more to tell me where this song is going at that point to keep me going in deeper, deep into the song. Um, so that's what I would suggest first. And I think that's going to make a big difference. Um, this beautiful verse, another, another moment comes and goes, do I even know? Another sunrise grows and goes, do I even notice? It's just magnificent. It's absolutely beautiful, simple, conversational, and yet it captures depression really beautifully. And, and that sense of not moving, of going up and then coming down. And it's all the same. It's all the same. This song reminds me a lot. I talk about Nick Drake at times because I've done a lot of writing about his songs, his music. And um, this song reminds me a great deal of, um, if you're familiar with his stuff, um, uh, shoot, now I, lost, now I lost the title of it. Um, uh, but the string quartet, the style of your vocal, the style of the song, all of it suggests uh, Nick Drake uh, to me. And I think and he gets used a lot still today, even in 19, even in, in 2022, his songs from 1972 are still being used. The song is Day is Done. It's on his first album. And you'll hear echoes of this song. If you aren't already familiar with it, you may be. Um, people talk, but I don't listen. The disconnect is just beautifully done all the way through this. It's a fairly common scene, so it could definitely get uses. Beautiful track. Um, the vocal is just right. Be careful about never raising your volume too much. Keep that vocal restrained, because I think that's the mood that this character is in. Stay in character. And I just want to mention this to everyone. When you're writing for film and television, if you are the singer or you're bringing in a singer, Think about in terms of who the character of the singer is, because that becomes another sing an another character in the scene, almost. So if this was used underneath a scene in which people were feeling, someone was feeling this emotion, then the character of the singer should in fact impart this emotion right along with the music and the lyric. So think in terms of keeping your voice restrained because this person does not have um, emotional affect. What they're saying is, I don't have it. I don't connect. They don't listen to me. I can't reach them. I don't, I, I've given up. And so uh, keep that in your voice as you go through this song and, and re-sing it. I would definitely say um, in the stillness, down there in the stillness, I show no fear. Even I'm surprised. I thought that was great. What right? I mean, that's great writing. In the stillness, I show no fear. Even I'm surprised. I would rewrite the next two lines. I see a mirror. I see my face. Uh, a, a fading shadow. I mean, I would just describe yourself in the mirror. See what you see in that actual mirror. My mind has become blind. Doesn't mean anything to me. Um, uh, this this song is definitely worth working on. Well done, well done, Susie. You blow me away, Robin. The stuff that you uncover, the stuff that you notice, <laughs> like would fly by other people, even other song coaches. Um, you mm -hmm. have this uncanny ability to really get to the essence of stuff. So good on you for that. Thank you. Um, I also want to mention, I, I meant to mention this right at the top of the show. It has nothing to do with the show, sorry. But um, 
I got an email five minutes before we went live today from somebody saying, I was invited to go for a one-to-one, -one, a paid one-to-one -one with one of the other attendees in their hotel room during the rally. Um, I haven't sent out the notice to everybody yet, but no, we do not allow people to, like Robin, for instance, is not going to be taking people up to her room and doing one-to-ones in a room. We had a situation, in quotes, probably 15 years ago now, where somebody felt that somebody else who was coaching them for money up in a private room with the door shut did something untoward. There was no rape or anything being touched, but a lot of inference, let's say. Um, and, and so from that point forward, it's always been no. You, you, none of the um, teachers or mentors or panelists are allowed to take people up to their room and charge them for coaching sessions. So I just wanted to say that in case the person who sent me the email happens to be watching the show and for others. So there's that. Um, moving on now, this next one is called Eternal Flame. It is from Kenny Lee Young. And let me get my earbud back in. And here we go, faders up. Here it comes. Traffic jams and busy bees. But you and me. We're parked underneath the tree Growing roots under the fresh cut grass While everyone is moving fast The outside world says we're crazy But we keep going, going, baby Slow and steady They keep asking, I can't say Maybe we were born this way Calm and ready And maybe It's in our veins Destined to burn always And they say There's always change Except for this eternal flame oh, That's such a nice payoff line Great Great. Oh, it's beautiful. I love this payoff line, except for this eternal flame. And they say there's always change except for this eternal flame. That's a beautiful payoff line. And to me, that sums up what the whole song is about. And we want to make sure that the listener and music supervisors get that right away, that they understand what the concept is here. It's the you can imagine the type of scene that this would work with two young people who are kind of outsiders who don't fit in with everybody else and everybody else is partying like crazy and they aren't they're just the two of them being quiet um as you say in your opening verse traffic jams and busy bees but you and me were parked underneath a tree and i love that the next two lines are a little difficult to understand. The first two lines, we totally get it, right? And you want to be sure that you keep on doing that, that you keep giving that message, getting your message across. The next two lines, growing roots under the fresh cut grass while everyone is moving fast. I had to think that about that, and only because I had the lyric in front of me could I think that through. We're growing roots underneath the grass. We're so we're so staying here um and it's very cute but it's really a thought it's your left brain kind of jumping in and saying oh would, would, wouldn't this be clever be careful you want to say something that reinforces this idea of we are steady on together we're this love that we have is not changing it's it may be growing but it's not going to go away it's not changing it's not like everybody else rushing around so we want another example in the next two lines and that's what i recommend in general folks if you have a great opening pair of lines like this song does then in the next two lines see if you can reinforce that with another example or more information about those first two lines he's tried to do more information here but it got a little too complicated to follow so just take a look at those two love the vocal on this it reminds me a lot of alec benjamin henry jameson i love both those singer songwriters and they are both used a lot in film and television henry Jameson, J-A-M-I-S-O-N, and Alec, A-L-E-C, Benjamin. Um, they're 
excellent. And this is the this vocal is right there in that range, and it's a very very hot uh, place to be. Um, that your uh, the refrain here is a four line uh, chorus, and maybe it's in our veins, destined to burn always. And they say there's always change except for this eternal flame. Really a beautiful uh, refrain here. I think it's probably a little bit complex for film and television, um, but I think it's, it says this, it keeps, it really is focused on this idea of eternal flame. So what I would do is something I recommend a lot to people, and that is I would repeat the payoff line. Uh, and they say there's always change except for this eternal flame, except for this eternal flame. Which and I, I think I'll be used a lot. I, I've mm -hmm. got to say, I'm amazed that this writer, Kenny Lee Young, was able to, let's say, Eternal Flame is cliche. It's been used a gazillion times in songs. I don't think it's ever been used this well in a song. I love the way he used it. So yeah. good job, yeah. Kenny. <laughs> yeah, There's it's fresh, <laughs> it's witty, it's emotional. Um, it's got everything. The lyric is universal. It could be used in a lot of different scenes where there are characters who feel like their love is steady on, never going to change no matter what happens. It's a young love song. Could be uh, for an older couple, but the voice is so young, it's probably for young love. This could be used in on the Hall on the Hallmark Channel. It could be used um, on in any youthful um, romantic uh, comedy. Uh, and I, I comedy, dramedy. Um, and it's a beautiful song that I really think would work well. So take a look at uh, those lines and, um, and, and, keep, and keep on. The only thing that's ever racing is my heartbeat calling out and beckoning while the rest are manic and the move. I think it's too comp complicated. The only thing that's ever racing, rather than doing that, tell us more about what it means to be still and quiet and together and know that this is not changing. What kinds of things, how would you describe that? What could you compare it to? Everlasting love, eternal flame. Give us a, more examples of what that is, what that feels like. It's gotta be a challenge. I've never been a, a songwriter as close as, well, I, that's not true, I've written two songs, but as close as I would normally come back in the day before I started Taxi was doing a very light version of what Robin is doing when I was in the studio with an artist or a band where I'd say, you know, this line doesn't work, it doesn't make sense. I'm very intrigued, Robin, when you talk about things being over, overly complex, people, of course, want to try and write something really deep or something that's like where you notice the craft of their writing. But maybe that's the wrong approach, because if you're noticing the craft mm -hmm. of the writing and not just feeling it and internalizing it kind of through osmosis, um, maybe you've distracted from the song. You know, you're, you're listening in the context of analyzing. Um, Correct. For the average radio yeah. listener, um, they're not. And so I would feel as a songwriter very constricted because on one hand, I want to write something that other writers go, wow, man, you're really deep. <laughs> well, it depends on who you're writing for. I, yeah, I totally get that. Yes, absolutely. We all want to be taken seriously. We want to write serious songs. Yeah. But I mean, serious songs include uh, very, very simple songs. Uh, you know, it, they, it, it's not that... It's how complicated you make it it's how deeply you touch the listener so that that you know and move the listener um and there are many simple songs that move people very deeply um so i think that what we confuse is our left brain you know left brain right brain and the left brain's all rational and the left brain's all thinking about what it wants to accomplish and what its goals are and what it you know I, you have to watch out for that left brain thing i mean this is really all about your heart and your right brain it's all about imagination and creativity and saying the things that you know will touch other listeners so i always say just keep your listener by your side I, I don't, you know, and don't think of your listener as that other hot songwriter because that's not who this is for. By Keep the way, they don't buy your, your songs. Side. For all the years that I've been marketing this book, um, I am the publisher, by the way, which I haven't mentioned earlier in the show. But I always say to people, you know, don't pick up this book and read it cover to cover. Right, it's not a novel. This book is is the paper embodiment 
of Robin Frederick, and she's sitting next to you while you're writing. And if you go, I'm stuck on something, look at the table of contents and you can find the answer in these pages. So really this is more about using it as a resource than it is reading it cover to cover. Just my own two Thank cents. You. Thank you. And, and that was a big part of what attracted me to write the check and be the publisher. I remember uh, we borrowed, I want to say $35,000 from our daughter Hannah's college fund to order the first pallet or two pallets of this book. You used to have to order all these books, yeah, (laughs) from the printer. Now we just, they do print on demand now. It's just so much easier. Yeah, it was expensive to do. Um, Yeah, and and I, you know, songwriting is, I, I, listen to the song examples. I saw, oh my gosh, I don't want to take too much time to do this. We've got to keep going. But I just want to say something very funny that I saw a review on Amazon. And it was a it was a good review. I mean, he gave the thing like four or five stars. But he said, it's really, it's useful. But I've never heard any of the songs that she mentions. <laughs> and I thought, the point is to listen to the songs. Please go listen to the don't sit there and go well i've never heard any of those songs so no go listen to them that's why it says do this now go listen to this song because if you hear it you go oh oh i could do that yeah right and it reinforces you get to hear it you get to it's physical it's getting it in your body it's embodying sing along with this song i'll say that a lot too sing along with this song get it in your body physicalize it for yourself because songwriting is actually a much more physical thing than it is a mental thing Hmm. and what to come back to what you were talking about thinking about it how, how can i impress these people i want to write something really serious and impressive and everything that's 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 up here right you're you're making it overly complex keep it here keep it down here keep it in your heart keep it in your body make your you know if you're going to write a strut song make it be, you feel like you want to strut because that's what you want to make the listener do and that's physical that's why we call it a strut song that kind of i'm proud I, i'm walking down the street i know I can, what i can do it really makes you want to move that way if it doesn't make you want to move that way then it's not a very good strut song you know don henley is definitely one of the greatest living examples of people who can write an extremely uncomplex but highly impactful lyric Uh, anybody who wants to study writing lyrics where there's not a wasted syllable and and you listen to just one line and go oh my god that just like like put an arrow in my heart don henley's your guy seriously worth listening to yes studying for lyrics absolutely okay can we we should keep going yeah we should I, i should interview him for the road rally one year just about his lyric craft that would be fun All right, this one is called I Got a Feel. It's by Alex Ridley. Fader up. Take it or leave it, but if you're leaving, understand. Make no mistake, this was not what I had planned. Give me a reason, I know I shouldn't make demands. I gotta stand for something. So reach out and take my hand I came here to show that I've been missing you All I really know I should be kissing you I want you so badly I'm done with waiting, can't you see? I know you want me to Can it just be you and me? I gotta feel as though you're really gonna be there It's not as if we got all the time in the world Good. Thank you. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. Um, So this is very interesting. All of these songs are interesting and they're all good. Um, So we're looking at whether or not this is a universal lyric. Um, It's got a good, it's got a catchy melody. Love the melody. Um, And um, uh, I take it or leave it. That's the opening line. Take it or leave it. It's a great statement. It's really in your face. Take it or leave it. But if you're leaving understand make no mistake this was not what i had planned that doesn't track for me as well as uh, your opening take it or leave it but if you leaving understand i would expect that next line to refer back to take it or leave it um if, if you were leaving understand i'm not going to take you back again 
Um, so I couldn't quite follow that third line in, in that first verse. And as we were saying earlier, music supervisors will listen to, you know, to get the tone and the emotion. And once they've got that, then they're just kind of checking the lyrics to see if there's anything they can use. And um, if they can't, if something like that happens by the third line, they'll tend to pull away and they may not get any further. And you don't want that to happen. Um, and um, so this is a guy who's talking to another person in a, it's obviously a relationship situation. And we have plenty of scenes that are relationship situations. Um, but I think this one is not as clear or focused as, as it would need to be um, on the emotion that's going on here. So we get to, we've got a situation in which two people seem to be breaking up. That's, there's plenty of common scenes like that. And we get to this chorus, I've got to feel as though you're really going to be there. It's not as if we've got all the time in the world. I love that line. It's not as if we've got all the time in the world. And then I know that you've been searching. Now you want to see where, which isn't finished. It doesn't go on. Um, and then it's not as if we've got all the time in the world. So the interesting line here is the payoff line. It's the one that's the title and it's the one that's repeated twice in the chorus. It's not as if we've got all the time in the world, but I don't think that the rest of the lyric is really, um, you know, building on that in, a, in the way in with the kind of strength that it could be. So there, take a, that idea. Um, it's not as if I had some ideas. Uh, there's if, when you listen to the line, it's not as if, um, that we've got all the time in the world. What is the emotion that's going on there? There's some urgency. There's some need. The singer feels. Um, the singer's done waiting. Um, and so you could be saying things like, love has its moment. It's here and gone. That's why we don't have all the time in the world, because there's a moment for love. And when you just try to drag that out and it's not going anywhere, love kind of fizzles out. That's one way to treat that line. Another way might be we're only human, things change. Uh, we haven't got all the time in the world. What happens if something happens to you or me tomorrow? We haven't got all the time in the world. Um, and so those might uh, support that line a little more effectively if you work backwards from it. So once you have your payoff line or your title line, first or last line of your chorus, um, payoff line is the last line, but it could be either, you know, either one of those lines, first or last line of the chorus is really important. Also, the opening two lines of your song, I call those the key lines. And um, you need to think about those as you develop your lyric. You can't just be writing lines that seem like they feel good because you might be writing five songs. And that's and, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Pull them apart and write five songs. You got the start of at least two or three songs here, I think. But um, it's not sticking around your central core idea, which I think is really strong and might very much uh, attract a music supervisor because it could be used in any scene in which someone's feeling very angsty, very urgent, that this love thing isn't going where the way it should be going. Um, looks like it might be falling apart. Any of those things would any kind of those scenes like that would work well with that with that payoff line, but the rest of the lyric needs to support it. Have you ever looked at one of your songs or somebody's songs? How does somebody know when they've got three songs in one, and and how do you know when to call the game, throw the flag on the play, and go? You know what? I'm dropping this song it's not going anywhere and then go back and look, are there any songs buried in the rubble of this thing? Right. And that's exactly what happens. Now yeah. this one got finished, but it isn't really finished because uh, I'm looking at the last verse and I'm reading, I came here to show that I've been missing you. Um, and I don't know what that would have to do with. It's not as if we had all the time in the world, but it, it could be, or it could be a completely other song. I came here to show that I've been missing you. And here's what I'm going to do to show you that I've been missing you. That's that song. And mm -hmm. then um, all I really know is I should be kissing you. That's another song. That's a wonderful song. Um, uh, I'm done with waiting. Can't you see? That might be this one. I've got a, you know, this, it's not as if I've got all the time in the world or you've got, we've got all the time in the world. I'm done with waiting. Can't you see? Things change. Things move on. It's the world is moving on in front of us. We, and we're stuck here in this moment. It's time we, you know, it's, it's not going to, we don't have all the time in the world. There's wonderful songs, a couple of wonderful songs about, um, I'm going to 
love you like I'll never see you again. That's uh, Megan Trainer has one, Alicia Keys has one. And that's a beautiful theme. I may not see you something, you know, I may not see you tomorrow. We might, we won't always be here. Yeah. Um, and those are very well developed songs. Both of them um, love me uh, like you'll never see me again is Alicia Keys. And then the Megan Trainer and John Legend song is the other one. And I can't remember the title of it right now, but that's the only one they've done together. You can find it online and check out how they handle that theme. If you're interested in doing it here. How do you know as a writer? How can you be objective enough to know uh, this thing is turning out to be a stinker? And or even if you don't think it's a stinker, maybe you're missing the obvious. Maybe there are lyrics in, you know, lines in that lyric that are screaming out to you, hey, dum dum, here's your hit. How, how does somebody train themselves to? I, you know, it's hard that. because you lose perspective. Yeah. You don't have perspective on it yourself. I know that's why I say keep your listener by your side. Um, so, a couple of things you can do. One is, Go, you know, taxi screeners. Uh, you can request a custom. You can ask that question and say, is my lyric tracking or have I got more than one song here? Is this, you know, is this flowing correctly or am I getting off uh, into it on some tangent here? You can ask that question of someone like that or of a, a music coach like me. Or here's the other thing that I really recommend, which is don't work on your song too long at once. What happens is when you sit down and you work for one song on for three hours, which believe me, I can do, and I'm sure you can all do it too. It's like three hours goes by like nothing. And um, what you've done is you lost perspective at some point and got bored with the lines you were writing and you started changing them and pretty, and you go, Oh, I like that one. That's clever. That's cute. That's different. Nobody, I like that. There's a rhyme. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. And all of a sudden you're writing from your left brain. You're being overly clever and you're trying to entertain yourself instead of trying to think about, is my listener gonna understand what I set out to say? So the way around that, and I talk about this in my course, uh, Songwriting Faster and Better, which I which I did it, it the first year of the Virtual Road Rally. Actually, I did it last year at the Virtual Road Rally. I extended it into a full course, and at the moment, it's free. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you, Songwriting Faster and Better, and one of the things I talk about in one of the sections is what I call the fresh ears test. If you lose your fresh ears, just listening over and over and over and making changes, you're going to wreck your song. And eventually you're going to go, I hate this. And you put it away. And maybe you take it out later, you know, and you go, that wasn't so bad. Why did I put it away? So the way you get around this is don't work on your song for so long at the same, at once. Don't sit down and work on a song longer than 45 minutes, wow. maybe an hour, but I'd say 45 minutes and make it intense. Decide what you're going to do in your 45 minutes. What am I going to be able to accomplish and try to get as much as you can done in 45 minutes, record it, even if it's just a lyric. If you're a lyric only writer, record that lyric and and record your guitar, vocal, rough, awful, terrible, piano, vocal, whatever. Walk away. Come back after you've had a chance to clear it out of your head. Go do something else. Work on another song if you really need to and go do something else and then come back with fresh ears and give it the fresh ears test. Play it and listen to it as if you haven't heard it before because you got it out of your head, play it and you go, wow, that got too complicated. Make notes on what you want to change, get sit down, make one of those changes or two of those changes, record it, walk away, come back, listen again as a listener would. That's why you have to record it. When you sit and play, you're not being a listener. You're feeling the groove and you're you know singing along and change, tweaking things. Don't do that, record it walk away, do something else, come back, listen to it with fresh ears, make your notes, sit down, make those changes, walk, record it, walk away. That's the four part fresh ears test. And when you do that, if you can discipline yourself to do that, and you really need to, then you are constantly listening like your own listener. It's the only way I know how to be a listener on your own song is to constantly record, walk away, come back with fresh ears, listen to it, make a list of what you want to change, make a couple of changes, record it, walk away. The I have that were, on my wall. The Eagles were recording uh, Hotel California Criteria Studios when I worked there. And uh, Bill Simzik, their engineer producer, had a rule with the band. When he was mixing, he would get the overall balance, reverb, and EQ worked out. And then he would, he would do that with nobody in the room other than his assistant engineer. And then he would let the band come in. He would give everybody a legal pad and say, all right, you each write down one or two thoughts 
things that you noticed and then go away. And he would look at the legal pad and go, that's valid. Nope, that's too self-serving. <laughs> that's just yeah. a bad idea. And he would take the good stuff and incorporate it and then bring them back in. And, and so that way he didn't have to get overwrought about, you know, when, when you're mixing and you're hearing the same section over and over and over again, mm -hmm. you lose all perspective. So he got fresh ears, but then kicked them out before they became stale, which I thought was really smart. Yes. And if you don't have a band, just come in and, and critique <laughs> right. it for you. And the thing is, you know what you, your vision is for the song. When you come back with fresh ears, you know what it is you want that song to do. And if it's not doing that, then you make a change to make it closer to what it is you want it to do. Rather than, gee, I'm getting really tired of this after three hours of working on it. I'm going to start changing it. And yep. that's deadly. That's when you wreck your song. All right. Speaking of songs, we got two more yeah. to go here. Let's go. Uh, this one's called Best Day Ever. It's by Anthony Hutchcroft. Let's have a listen. Hello, 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 hello. Best day ever. Listen to the birds sing. Well, you wait to see the sunrise. Will you stand upon a mountain and open your eyes? Take your future in your hands and mold it like clay, mold it like clay. Let the world know you got something, something to say, something to say. Um, I really like the fact that you opened with a hello, 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 best day ever. So right away, the, it, you know, right at the top of the song, it's here's where we're going. Here's where we're going with this. Welcome to my song. Here's where this is where it's headed. And then you do not disappoint. Will you listen to the birds sing? Will you wake to see the sun rise? Will you stand upon a mountain and open your eyes? Excellent lyric for um, so, uh, commercial use. I think you might have written this uh, to be used in commercials. And uh, those three lines right there are good examples of, this is why I'm saying hello. I might do any of these things today. I might listen to the birds sing, wake to see the sunrise, stand upon a mountain and open your eyes. That's a beautiful line. It's a beautiful image and a beautiful line. Um, the next line, take the future in your hands and mold it like clay. Now, so it's so far what you've been doing is using what I call trigger words, words with emotional associations, sunrise, birds sing, mountaintop, open your eyes. All of these trigger the feeling, uplifting feelings in the singer. Mold it like clay doesn't evoke a strong emotional response. So I would say that line probably is wasting some of the energy that you build up. It's sort of unraveling it. So take a look. I like the idea of take the future in your hands. I would probably just say another phrase like that. Take the future in your hands. Do this other thing. Let the world know you've got something to say. There needs to be a transition line that, that leads you to let the world know you've got something to say. That's, that's missing in there. Uh, instead of uh, replace the mold it like clay with that. Le something that leads into your next line. Then you're into your chorus, hello, hello, hello. Now we have a lot of repetition here, which is fine. Hello, hello, the first line has lots of hello, four hellos, best day ever. You can do another line like that. The third line, which you did, the third line, you know, you know, you know, kind of isn't going anywhere. We're kind of, st we're a little bit static by that time. So I would say on the third line, and this happens a lot of times on the third line, of a four line repeat when people are repeating four lines, um, you know, do something different on the third line. I mentioned that earlier here. I think you could do more with your third line. I wouldn't do a repeat like that. You know, you know, you know, you know, because it doesn't do anything to keep the listener uplifted. So I would actually not even bother with repetition, um, you know, word repetition on that line. I would actually go ahead and write a lyric for that line that, that says everything you want to say about why are we saying hello? Um, 
what is it? What does that feel like? Or what is that? What's the reason for that? And give put that in the third line of your chorus so that that chorus can stand alone. And that's a big part. We haven't talked about that today. Standalone choruses for film and television, because a lot of times the only thing they will use is your chorus. And so you don't want to have to have uh, any explanation of nothing has to support that. The, the chorus should stand alone on its own and make its own statement. And I think you could do that right there in that third line. It's, you know, life is so good. Uh, life is perfect. Life is good. When you look at it the right way, when you come at it, you know, with, with hope, with happiness, however, whatever it is you want to say, that's the heart of this song. And then hello, 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 best day ever really makes sense. If you give that third line a little bit more, more information for the listener um, that and and stick with words that have a lot that trigger a lot of those walking on sunshine kind of feeling um, because that that type of image just lifts you right up out of your shoes uh, even something like that lift me up out of my shoes diamonds on the soles of my shoes all of those diamond days diamond sky use words that evoke the emotion you want in that third line and then when you go hello 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 best day ever the listener goes yeah i get it i agree and that's what you need on that third line okay all right last one um by the way i want to mention the red rally november 3rd through the 6th uh at the Westin lax uh, if you haven't registered yet do it um we're right around 1900 registrants so far and we've got what like 10 days to go or something um, what did I want to say? Oh, this past weekend, I spent an inordinate amount of time working on the print directory that goes in all the goodie bags. And I, first of all, I want to say Angel did a really good job at collecting all the bios from everybody and, and fitting them into the schedule. So good job, Angel. Great job, actually. Um, I had to read every single sentence numerous times in that book during the course of the weekend because we we're proofing and reproofing and reproofing it. Best batch of one-to-one -one mentors that I think we've ever had at a taxi road rally are going to be there for this rally. The best batch. I have no doubt in my mind about it. Just an incredibly wide array of skills, incredibly man, just people with great resumes. So if you're coming to the road rally, sign up for your one-to-one -one mentor um, you can go on the website taxi.com rally and you can see the mentor bios now so you can start thinking about who you want to pick so there's that and now let's listen to a song called enough yeah and this is by ron day Uh, a wonderful 60s vibe here. I really was pulled back to some of the great hits of the 1960s when there was just this wonderful bouncy energy that just said life is good. And um, I can remember getting ready for high school and the Beatles would make my day look a whole lot better. <laughs> um, and so I love this. Uh, it really uh, has a lot of that vibe in it. Um, the the chorus which i really like um i think is it's you it's me it's us some things are just enough it's you it's me it's us it's us it's us and that's enough it's simple it's catchy you're not going to be able to get that out of your head um you've got a great verse that leads into it like time you're catching up to me this rhyme perfect as can be sweater weather is just a bit away 
you wear it awesome anyway. It, I, you know, if you think about it, it like, doesn't make sense, but I love it that it's sweater weather, you wear it. <laughs> you know, it's like you're wearing your sweater really awesomely. I thought it was very, very cute. Interesting, fun play on words. You don't have to think about it. It's just fun and, um, and kind of silly. And then it goes into this great, it's you, it's me, it's us. Um, the second uh, verse, time to forget yesterday, it's why I let it play was I wanted to hear how it sounded. It sounds like you're over, you're trying to think too much on the second verse. I would go back to the nonsense quality, the silly, quirky, fun quality of that first verse. There's too much here about history and it's t time for a pretty here today. I don't quite know what that is. Time to forget yesterday. I would just drop, I would write a new verse. See if you can beat this one and keep that sense of you and me together. It's enough. What do you want to say about that's enough? You, you know, you've got everything I need. I've got everything, you know, the sky to breathe. I got, yeah, just have fun with it like you were with that first four lines. I know that's hard. Sometimes you get an inspired first four lines. It's really difficult to, to come up with another four lines as good as your inspired lines, but you have to do it. This is the discipline of songwriting. We really have to, to have to write as good as our inspiration gives us. So sit down and look at what your song is trying to say and try saying it in different ways that you think the listener might understand using the kinds of words that evoke those feelings uh, that you did in the first uh, verse. Um, I think this is very, very good potential for commercial uses um, and potential for uh, uh, episode episodic TV too. Walking, running down the street together. It's enough for us. Isn't this wonderful? And I think that there are a lot of, of uses there. I love the track. I think the vocal is just right for it. So I think you're very, very close. Just take a look at that second verse. Yeah, vocally, melodically, and vibe-wise, this thing, I mean, if all you did was sing na, na, na with, with that <laughs> vocal quality and, and the uplifting nature of the song that would almost be enough the lyrics are icing on the cake well robin gotta hold the book up again i know i know but you know if everybody should have this book you've seen all the comments in the chat room today literally i i have had i don't even know how many years this book has been out but i've always had the offer and i put it in writing when we send out emails about it if you don't think this book was worth what you paid send it back to me in resellable condition. I will refund your money. Only once has anybody ever done that. And I swear the guy Xeroxed the book and then sent it back to me to get the refund. Oh, oh well, got to give him points. He probably spent more on paper to Xerox it than he did to actually buy the book. But um, people love this book. They lo love the sequel to it, which is Shortcuts to Songwriting for Film and TV, which I'm not going to hold up today. There, there it is behind Robin on the right side of her, well, left side for us. The green one. Right. Green, if I yes, hold it up with one. my green screen, it gets a see-through cover. <laughs> right. Uh, right. And yeah, and I've got the, the e-book version of it. If you don't want to have a lot of paper at your house, you want to save a tree, the e-book version of it is revised and updated. I have put uh, all the original sh shortcuts in there, plus a whole bunch of new ones, about 70 new ones um, throughout. And uh, all, also um, new, more recent uh, references to songs. Now, I don't think there's any difference in the quality of the songs, but I, uh, it's just that if you're interested in some of the more rhythmical stuff that we're doing now, especially in R&B, uh, rock, pop, and country, the very rhythmical melodies that we're using now, that was one reason why I did that update. Um, and it's if you like eBooks, it's really easy to use. I am opening up the schedule to the road rally so that I can tell you what time Robin is going to appear oh, on Saturday. Because I don't know. I don't <laughs> yeah, we're close. We're close. 1045, I think. I was surprised, I remember, when I was proofing the ballroom uh, uh, brochure. I was surprised. Oh, it's not 11. It's 1045, I think. So I'm glad you're doing that because I have to put some signage together. Um, while he's doing yeah, that, right. I will be 1045 to 1145. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. And, and I will also be, um, you mentioned the mentors. I'm not going to be mentoring with the regular mentors. I don't usually do that, but on Saturday afternoon from one 30 to three 30, I will be at my booth. It will be first come first serve. We'll have a line there. You'll get to chat. I try to go really quickly through those, uh, everybody. I don't sit there and, and give them 15 minutes each or anything like that. Um, it'll be light feedback and I'll listen. Um, if you want me to keep something of yours, bring a CD and I'm happy to take CDs home. Um, 
and I will be there. And somebody will be keeping the line kind of quiet. You can talk. You can certainly talk. We'll be keeping the volume down because the ballroom is right next to, uh, right across from my booth. Um, Friday and Saturday, uh, Thursday night, Friday and Sunday, I won't be at the booth. But if you would like to buy a book, you can buy it at the registration desk. And where you, when you come in, where you register for the rally and just and on Saturday, bring it with you and I'll sign it. I'm doing book signing right after my talk at 1145 and in the ballroom. And then I'll also be signing books at my table. So um, come so on. You're going to take a little in. break. You're going to do the ballroom book signing and then you're going to take a little lunch break and then come back and sign at the booth. Correct. That's right. Okay. That's right. I'll start the booth at 1.30, but I'll be done with the, um, the ballroom by about, I think, 12.30 is when we're winding that up. After my lecture in the ballroom, I'm doing about 45 minutes of buy a book, and I'll sign it right there. So um, after my lecture, and then again at the booth in the afternoon. Your best bet if you want to have a book signed is to bring it to the ballroom, and then after I finish my lecture, there'll be a, a, it's usually a much shorter line. You can pop in there, and I'll sign your book. Uh, one last thing before we go, Rena Shiloh asked the question, who are the presenters on the panels? Where can we get that info? We have a website at taxi.com. You can go to the top navigation and look for free convention and everything you need to know about the rally is on there. So there Great. you go, guys. Uh, I will see you. Uh, I'm going to be back next Monday, right before the rally. The rally starts on Thursday. Um, and we're doing the bag stuffing and shipping material to the hotel and all that stuff earlier in the week, getting ready for the rally. But just know that I am planning to do a taxi TV a week from today on Monday. And I'm going to answer questions like Arena's question. I'm just going to do ask Michael anything about the road rally because people are getting ready to jump on planes. It's like, where do I get the shuttle? Well, I happen to know that if you come out of the baggage area and try and get the shuttle on the lower level of the airport, you'll be standing there until you die. Um, you actually go back up to departure levels to get shuttles now at LAX because they're doing all kinds of work there. So you come out, you get your bag from the carousel and then take an elevator or escalator back upstairs and look for the little red sign, which is about this big because they want to make it as hard to find as possible where you should be standing to get the shuttle. But there is a shuttle from the hotel every 15 minutes. It's free. You don't need a rental car. The hotel is very excited that we're coming back. The staff is great. Um, that's it. Robin, you're a genius. I've been telling you that for, I don't know, how long have we known each other? Like 15 years? Or long something? time. Yeah. yeah. We were both 14 when we met. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure. pleasure. Always. It's great to see all of you guys. I wish I could watch the chat room while I'm doing this, but I can't do it. So um, I, it's just been lovely to have all of you here. And um, thanks for having me, Michael. This is always a pleasure. The songs are all great. You're doing wonderful work. It always makes me happy to see taxi members getting better and better and better. Um, you're really listening. You're really working. And you're serious about your craft. And that is uh, an absolutely wonderful thing. I always say taxi members know more about songwriting than any other group on the planet. They really do. And that's because um, they're here. Yeah, that's because we put you in front of them all you, the time. That's <laughs> no, because you do taxi TV every week. You learn yeah. a lot from taxi TV. Well, thank you for doing it again. And thank you guys for tuning in and being brave to submit your songs takes courage. Yeah. So thank yeah. you all. See you next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye, you guys. <laughs>